Good morning. Welcome to Griffin Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Barry Vaughn. You're actually inside of Griffin Baptist right now in my office. Hope you enjoyed that hymn by the Wesley Brothers. Uh, they're always a blessing to hear their music. This morning, I'm glad you're with us wherever you're with us, whenever you're with us. Um, this morning, we're continuing on with our Beatitudes series. This has been a very um, enlightening, I think a convicting series at times to even look at ourselves and examine ourselves in light of this famous sermon of Jesus. This morning, we're going to continue on with it, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. While you're getting there, let me, let me remind you that October is right around the corner. Um, so excited about that, especially in the season that we're in with COVID and whatnot. It's just going to be nice to be able to be outdoors, be able to do fun things outdoors safely. Um, Lauren and I are very much looking forward to that. For our church on October 31st, which is a Saturday this year, we are having our fall festival in the cemetery. Uh, we're going to have tables spaced out like, like it's always done here. I encourage you, if you want to participate in that, get in contact with Laura McLean. You can get a table from her. And uh, even if you're not going to be involved in that, please donate candy to the church. I'm not one who should be trusted too much with candy, but you're free to give it to me and I'll get it to where it goes to and invite everyone you know to come out to that Lauren and I we were talking this morning we even know some folks coming all the way from Oconee County just because a lot of the things that are going to take place in Oconee County at some places just aren't not even trying to be safe and people do want to be safe during this time of year so they're looking forward to coming all the way out here to do this with us so invite others that you know as well Matthew chapter 5 let's look at the Word of God we're going to read verses 1 through 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, we want to draw so much attention, praise, and honor to you, supremely to you above all other things. Lord, you are unlike any other. You are supreme above all. You are mighty. You are righteous. You are good. You are just. You are loving. Lord, we thank you for all that encompasses that what you are, shown to all of us here upon your earth, Lord. You are the best, Lord. You are the best Father, and we thank you for making yourself a father to us and adopting us and calling us out from wickedness and, to, and the world and into your family. Lord, this work you deserve so much cre credit and praise for, and we want to give you that this morning. Father, as I come before you, I thank you for your word. Lord, thank you supremely for your word. Thank you for all that it says. Thank you for all the truths that it teaches. Lord, thank you for preserving it. Thank you for bringing people to salvation through it for so many hundreds and thousands of years before we've even come to it this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would do what you've always done with your word. I pray that you would convict. I pray that you would comfort. I pray that you would teach, that you would edify, Lord. I pray that your spirit would move in and around and through all that we're doing here together this morning, whether here online or outside. Father, be with all of those who you've put under my pastoral care, Lord. Lord, if they not be sheep and they be goats, Lord, make them sheep. Lord, and if they be sheep, make them faithful, following sheep. Lord, allow me to be the sort of pastor they need at a sort of time like this. Allow me to speak your word truthfully and rightly. Guard me from error, Lord. Guard me from any attention or grandeur that may come from it. And may you receive all the glory that is due alone to you. Father, I do ask all these things. And your most precious name. Amen. So to begin this sermon to you this morning, we're going to look at meekness this morning. I want to begin with a story I heard a minister say one time. And it's always stuck with me. And I've heard two other ministers that I really like tell this story. So I want to tell it to you. Because I think it kind of brings what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount here together. There was a thief one time. And he was a genius thief. Um, he was not just your average burglar who would break glass, run into a place, put it all in his bag, throw the bag on his, 
his bag on his back and run away. This thief broke into a store one night, and what he did was he just switched all the price tags and everything. He took diamond necklaces with $1,000 price tags, and he put it on worthless little pieces of plastic. And he took things that were worthless little pieces of plastic for $0.25, cent and he put them on very expensive things. He just switched the price tags on everything. And then he left. He turned the lights off, locked up, left. Came back the next day to the store to shop, got himself a little basket and a little buggy, went through the store, loaded his buggy up, went to the cash register. He bought expensive things for nothing, and he bought cheap things for expensive prices. It, it, it was one of the most ingenious heists ever. Um, of course, the stir, store clerks bagged his stuff up for him, smiled at him, thanked him, held the door for him, and he went about his business. And the point of that story is to tell you this is how it is in our day. The devil has switched the price tags on basically everything that we know. He's made cheap things of costly virtues. He's made them cheap. Things like meekness, patience, humility, and submission. He's put cheap price tags. And he's taken costly virtues and he's made them cheap. Other virtues worth hardly anything, they're worth nothing, have been marked so far up. Things like self-fulfillment, self-esteem, self-worth, gentleness are now in the bargain basement. They're cheap imitations. These, these cheap things, there's, there's these cheap things that are being sold for such expensive prices that it's just not the real price. Things like self-assertion, self-determination, self-satisfaction, self-importance, self-regard. They've been moved to the storeroom window and put on display for all to see so that they may desire them and have them for themselves. This is the way that the devil is stealing things even now from the church and the world in our day. This is why the Beatitudes are so important to us. Jesus is putting price tags back in right order in the Beatitudes. He's taking the things that are actually worth something and he's making them worth something again. And the things that are worth nothing, he's making them worth nothing again. Things that are valuable are truly found to be so here in the Beatitudes. The riches are laid out for us. If you look at the Beatitudes, the riches are laid out. The kingdom of heaven, comfort, inheriting the earth, being filled, receiving mercy, seeing God, treasure in heaven. All those riches are laid out and the cost is given as well. Poverty of spirit, mourning, meekness, hunger, peacemaking. The costs are given to things as well. Today, I want to look at the third Beatitude here in Jesus' text this morning. And I want to show you what the true value according to Christ is. And I want to show you the true estimate of God in the economy of heaven. And this will be different than what the world tells you. So first, we need to look at the meaning. That's what we need to do. If you've read this text like I have, surely you've read it and you've come across and said, Blessed are they who are meek. And you've wondered, what does that mean? And maybe your translation says gentle or humble. And we still need to really know what he means by that. So what does it mean to be meek? First, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It does not mean to be weak. Meekness is not weakness. And I'm not the first guy to say that. I'm not going to be the last guy to say that. That is true. Meekness, we think, is weakness. We think meekness is weakness and that it's somehow spineless or it lacks conviction. We think it's weak. We think that it can be a spirit of compromise, but it's not. It's not someone who just tolerates anything and everything and just goes along with it. It is not a peace at any price kind of person. Numbers 12 verse 3 says that Moses was the most meek man to ever live, doesn't it? And Moses was anything but a rollover and play dead kind of leader. He was strong, he was aggressive, and he was a man's man. And yet, he was the meekest person to ever live aside from the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you remember, even in the account that is talking about there, Moses was shepherding a group of people, a rebellious, agitated, complaining, griping group of people through a wilderness experience. And he was able to do it meekly and strongly. 
In classical Greek, this word can mean, this word meek can mean mild, soft, or gentle. It's a word used for a soft breeze or a soothing medicine. But most particularly in, at this time, the word was used for a wild colt, an untamed horse with an unbridled spirit that was broken by a trainer and brought under the control of a rider. This is what the word was used for. It's not the legs of the horse that is broken, though, is it? The horse can still run with all of its vigor and its strength and its energy, but it is the will of the horse that is broken. You know, my mom grew up with horses uh, out in Spartanburg, South Carolina. My family's from Chesney and Mayo, very small towns. You guys think you're from a small town in Pickens. I mean, Mayo, no one even knows what Mayo is. They didn't even, I think they just got a red light recently. Um, and just one of them. I think cows outpopulate people in that town. My mom grew up riding horses. I grew up hearing a lot about horses. I grew up watching horse movies like Man from Snowy River, Lonesome Dove. We've all got, we've all know, hopefully, we're, this is America. We're the land of the wild stallions and the cowboys. These wild horses that come under and get tamed by a rider. What this word for meek came to mean was this, this picture of this, power under control. Power under the direction of a higher authority. To meek a horse meant to bring a horse into submission. That's what it means. To meek a horse meant to bring it under the control of a master. Perusis is the Greek word. And uh, for, those, for you Sunday school teachers, I want you to listen up. If you're not a Sunday school teacher, feel free to go, I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, I don't teach anybody. Okay. If you're a Sunday school teacher, listen up. There's, when we're looking at Greek words, what you need to be doing in your own personal study, when you're looking at especially New Testament Greek word, you want to see, has, is this word common? Do we see this word anywhere else in Scripture? This word is seen one other place in Scripture and one other place only, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. It's the only other place you see the word meek used the exact same way, perusis. Now, if it was never used that way in another place, that's called a hypoxagomena, which is, which is an anomaly. That's a crazy word, I know. But that is Bible study. You're going to be a Bible teacher. We need to understand the intricacies of words and why they're important. This is not a hypoxagomena. We see it other places, but it is extremely rare. It's only seen one other place. It can't. It almost can't be more rare than this. So it is important that we hone in, zone in on it, and see what it means here in this context. When applied to a person, this word means the person who has lived previously to do things their own way. Now, I know, you know, we love Elvis and Frank Sinatra, but that I Did It My Way song is, is that, that would be the devil's anthem. That is not a Christian anthem. That is not something that a Christian should even hear that song and think, yeah, I did it my way, my way. No, when applied to a person, this means a person who previously was like Frank Sinatra and did it his way and says, I'll go my own way. I'll do what I want. I'll do it how I want to. I'll do it where I want to, when I want to. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. This person, it means for that person to be meek and to have their will broken. For this person to not be like that anymore. To come to a place of humility and to live their life under the authority of Jesus. It's surrendering to Christ. That's what it is. It's surrendering to Christ. It's coming under the lordship of Jesus the meek are gentle. You can use the word gentle. It's a fine translation. I think the word meek is better because of the Greek word. But yes, the meek are gentle. They do not assert themselves over others to further their own agendas. They do, do not do this at all. They don't do it trusting in their own strength, but they trust God. And they don't, they don't trust their own strength or their own ability to drive the outcome of events, but they trust God to direct the outcome of events, like a horse trusting the rider. Meekness then is our wills broken, our spirits harnessed, and our souls subdued by repentance. Very simple. Go back in your own time, look at Psalms 37 verse 11. I think this is the root text for the verse this morning. Jesus would have known it. 
Jesus knew this verse, and I think he was drawing on it. It says, the humble will inherit the land and delight in abundant prosperity. The humble will inherit the land. Next, I want to show you two marks of what this meekness is. There are two marks of meekness. One is towards God, and the other is towards yourself. So first, let's, let's look at meekness towards self, toward yourself. It is explicitly in self Denial. It is to die to selfish ambitions, to self dreams, to self hopes, to self comforts. The Lord never begins until we come to the end of ourself. And you need to realize that. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus counts meekness as denying self and taking up your cross and following him. That's Matthew chapter 16. Notice it's, it doesn't say, he's not saying take up my cross. He says, take up your cross. We need to take up our cross. We have a cross. If you're following Jesus, you should have a cross of death, especially and namely death to self. You can walk down every church aisle from here to China, but until you come to the end of yourself, you can never enter the kingdom of heaven. It is a great burden for this pastor. Um, this is a hard time to exist in in the American church because so much of the American church is just made up of self. What I want, what I like, when I get to do my own thing, I'll go places I can do that and I can hear that and I, I, this is not meekness. This is not what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is not. It's a hard time. Listen, no one is meek who is doing their own thing. That is the opposite of meekness. No one is meek who is promoting their own agenda. Look at the second mark of meekness. So we look, so meekness has a mark of self, self-denial, death to self, cross-bearing. And it's also, there's meekness toward God. Surrender and submission to God. It's presenting yourself as a living and holy sacrifice to God. It's taking your hands off of your life and yielding your life to God. Resigning to your life, abandoning your life to God. This is what it is. It's a transfer of control and following Christ. Not myself or my ideas or the world, but Christ. It's of Christ. Matthew chapter 16, he says, follow me. Follow me. It's not enough to just deny yourself. You must be active. There must be a moving out. You must be taking initiative in following. No one is meek who's doing their own thing. No one is meek who's just following themselves and their own preferences, desires, and opinions or their own will. We need to die to ourselves and we need to pursue the will of the Lord. And this goes beyond just the outward veneer of religion. This goes deeper than just churchianity in America. This is to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. This matters. I also want you to see the model for this. There's a model for this. You're looking at this and you're going, well, who, who can I look at as a model? Jesus. Jesus is the model. Jesus is the supreme model. He even calls himself what? Gentle and humble. Gentle and humble, yet he was not a pushover, he was not spineless or anything, yet he was gentle and he was humble. Let me tell you, you and I, we're not there yet. We should never look at Jesus as the model of this and go, oh, I'm doing pretty good. No, if we're to see it rightly, we're doing awful, we're doing terrible, we're not doing good at all. We all need more meekness. We all need more of it. And, and relating to the will being broken, something, something following in submission to another's will. Let me show you a couple things here. How Jesus was the model of this. John chapter 5. He says, I do not seek my own will. If he is God and does not seek his own will, how arrogant are we to think that we should seek our own? Especially even within the context of a church that is not ours. Or in a world that we didn't create. Or in a life that that we didn't just bear out ourselves and give ourselves. It's his life, it's his church, it's his world. And even he says, I don't seek my own will. He says, what I do, I don't do of my own initiative. 
And this is our example here. But of the will who, of him who sent me. This should be us as well. In Jesus, you see self-renunciation, self-humiliation, self-denial. So how are you and I too good for it? Look at John chapter 6, verse 30. This is a slam dunk verse right here. He says, he came from heaven not to do his own will, but do the will of him who sent me. This is a meek person. This is the definition of meekness. You know, we exist in a time in America, in the church right now, especially where this is the tension. Are we going to do our own thing or are we going to do God's thing? Here at Griffin Baptist, as the pastor here, this is what I'm seeking to do. I have personal preferences and opinions as everyone else. But this is our fencing right here. We keep it right here. We keep it right there. What does God's will say? What does God's word say? What are we to do? How are we to do it? This is it. This is our fencing. If we follow this as Christians, because of that, we don't just rely on feelings to pull us. You know, I'm not a fool. I, I understand the, the emotional climate of an election year. I also understand I could open up the inside of a church building that I think would be rebellious and against the word of God during a time like this. And I could drop an American flag down behind the pulpit and I could put on a show and we could pack a building up. I'm not a fool. But that would be relying on feelings, and that would be relying on something outside of the Word of God for direction. That would be something driving our own will and our own preferences rather than dying to self and taking up the Word of God. We're not relying on some mystical experience either. I'm not a fan of people who say, well, I had a dream of this or I had a dream of that. I, I think God can strike a straight blow with a bent stick, but this is all sufficient. We don't need dream experiences. We don't need mystical experiences. We follow the word. We follow exactly what the word says to the letter, period. That's, that's what we need. It's all sufficient, even for a time such as this. This is the will of God revealed to us, right here in front of us, in black and white. You want God to speak to you? He has, and he's put it in writing. Read it. Jesus, perfectly, should be our goal. Matching him in meekness perfectly should be our goal. And you should not think that you see that perfectly. But what I do want you to test yourself against this morning is, am I seeing it progressively? Now, maybe not perfectly, but am I seeing it progressively? Do I have progressive death to self? Am I putting death to sin? Am I living more meekly? Is my tongue and temper being tamed better? Am I able to die and, and, and bear other people's preferences that aren't sinful? Am I able to do these things? Am I growing in this way? There's been generations within the church that has never grown that way and never been pushed to grow that way, and they're getting pushed now more than ever. We need to follow in Jesus' steps. And you might be asking yourself, okay, well, how do I do this? What are the means that I do this? So, what are the means? Go all the way back to first base. Go all the way back to beatitude number one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. First base. Did you actually ever arrive at first base? This, first, this verse 3 here has not lost its importance to this list of Beatitudes. It is put in a logical sequence. Go back to first base. Did you ever actually arrive at first? Well, I don't know if I did. Did you ever mourn? Did you ever have a verse 4? Did you ever get broken over your poverty of spirit? If you've never shed tears and you've never mourned, then no. You've never arrived at first. You need to go back to first. You need to go back there. You need to die and follow that sword there. Then, eventually, you can make yourself around to third, which is self-denial. And we can smite our chest and we can follow God. But you're going to have to go back to first for that. I want you to see the manifestation of this. The manifestation. What does it look like? This is important. We, we, it's, we can talk about being meek and having tame spirits, but what does it look like? The Bible does not leave us to guess. It doesn't. I give you concrete means of this. Concrete means for your life of what this meekness will be clearly seen as as it's lived out. And first, let me just begin with the home. It'll begin there. It'll be seen there. Each family member must submit to what God has assigned for them. It begins in your home. Wives, you must be in submission 
to your husbands. You must be under the authority of your husbands. And what does it say how you should do this? 1 Peter chapter 3. Gentle and quiet. Gentle and quiet. I, I know, I know. It's not what our modern culture says, but it's what the Word of God says, and it's perfect. You need to do this gently and with a quiet spirit. Gently and quietly. Husbands, you are to be submissive to your role as given to you by God, as you being the spiritual leader of your home. This has been assigned to you by God. And you're to love your wife as Christ loves the church. And this is sacrificially, to sacrificially give yourself. This is to lead your home meekly then. Because we understand to be meek is to die to self then. Children, you're to be meek as well. You're to be submissive to your parents. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Obeying them. The Greek word even there is the same word we get from acoustic. It means to hear. Children, you are to hear your parents and to obey what you hear. Children are to be meek then. This carries over into work. It doesn't just stop at home and, well, we live this out at home, but when we leave, we go to work and, you know, my pat, you know, my, my boss, he's not a Christian. My boss is a pagan, so I don't have to do that there. No. Yes, you do. If you work for yourself because you can't obey other people, you're not a meek person. You're not meek. Look at work. This begins with the attitude of a servant's heart at work. This is how it begins. It's not just, yeah, I did that. But it's to, as Scripture says, render obedient service as unto the Lord. Now, let me ask you, what if the Lord asked you to go sharpen that pencil? I bet you'd take the whole box and sharpen the whole box to a fine point and give it to him with a smile on your face. This is how you should do it for your employer. We should do as unto the Lord, even for our unconverted employer. That is meek. And the employer is to be in submission to the role given to him as the employer, as the boss. The employer should be fair, and he should be just in what he pays and what he expects from his employees and his care for them. You know, if you're somebody that goes to work and you act rebelliously against your boss because he may be unconverted or just an unpleasant person, don't go around telling anybody you're a Christian because you are a bad advertisement for Christianity. That is not biblical Christianity. There is not enough programs or billboards to erase the hurt that you're going to smear on us for that kind of action. Look at the third area. These are concrete areas given to us in Scripture, what meekness looks like lived out. The third area is the church. It's lived out in the church. Each member is to be meek here. Everybody is to be meek here. And in submission, gladly, to their church leadership, their deacons and their pastor, as far as they're under Scripture. Of course, that's the caveat to all this, isn't it? Unless somebody's telling you to do something, causing you to sin against God or your brother, you obey gladly as unto the Lord. You know, we're outside at church here. Not everyone's comfortable. Not everyone agrees with it. But how would you react if Jesus was the pastor of this church and Jesus was outside? I bet you wouldn't church hop. I bet you wouldn't not be involved in at least the online service, would you? You would be here. You'd be present online. You'd be present in the parking lot. You'd have a big old smile on your face and you'd be very supportive. This is the sort of people we're supposed to be because we're supposed to be treating each other, no matter who we are, as unto the Lord. We're supposed to treat each other with such reverence, love, and respect. Boy, if the world worked like that, it would be a perfect place. And this is why, this is the call of the church. This is the drive of the church. Lastly, I think a concrete area in Scripture where we can see this practically, concrete, clearly lived out meekness is seen in our nation or our society. Or maybe in our day, it's not seen so much so as it should be seen. Romans 13 tells us even unconverted government officials are appointed by God and we're to obey them. Even the unconverted. So that means if some devil-worshipping pagan became president, God says, I put him there, you obey him as far as he doesn't cause you to do something sinful against me or your brother. Now, you might be thinking, how can this be? How, how, why would God command? Give me something solid from Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2 commands the same thing. And Peter is writing to the church in Rome, who is a church under Nero Caesar. Now, you might not know who Nero is. 
there is a good case historically. Most of Christian history has always been agreement on John's letter in Revelation. When he's referring to 606 score and 6, he's putting in a coded form, Nero Caesar. It adds up to the same thing in other manuscripts that have changed it a little bit. And instead of saying 666, it'll say 616, he's referring to Nero. Nero is a typology of the Antichrist who lots of people expect to come down the road. So even if you're one of those folks and you're expecting an Antichrist, a world ruler, to rise and, and be anti-God and persecute the church, well, you, you can look back in history to the time in the first century where, where the church had to deal with that in Nero. And how did they deal with that? They obeyed him. They, they paid him taxes. They did everything commanded of them up to the point of sin. This is the strength of the church. The strength of the church isn't, oh, well, they're just this group of crazy people. They just disobey us every chance they get. All they do is follow their own passions and preferences, and if the authorities don't agree with it, they just rebel. We're people who say, you know, we don't like this, but God's given you us. So we're going to gladly obey this for you. And we're the people that when they cross a line into sin and we say we can't do that, it causes authorities to at least scratch their heads and go, why aren't they listening to this? They listen to everything. They always are such good citizens and obey us so readily and happily. They're not doing it now. What are we doing? We should strike that kind of thought in people. We're to be meek and to live by the laws that they bring. You might not like this. This is scripture, though. We are to be law-abiding, meek believers. And we only break laws when they go against God's word and cause us to sin. So then... At a time like this, then, outdoor worship could be seen as meek. Mask wearing could be seen as meek. Tax paying could be seen as meek. Accepting the outcome of elections could be seen as meek. Respecting social distancing guidelines in stores could be seen as meek. You might not like it. Maybe you're not meek. You can't be meek before the Lord. If you're not meek in your home, at your work, in your church, and in your society. That's the problem with the church in the world today. Meekness is so rare. There was a good um, prayer gathering the other day, yesterday in D.C. There's so much of that verse in Second Chronicles that we need to listen to, though. It's more than praying, isn't it? Humble yourselves. Pray. Seek my face. Turn from sin. You can't just pick one of those four things out and take that because God says, you do all of these things, all four of these things, then I'll hear. And where does it start? Humbling yourself. Meekness. Meekness is the start of it. You can't just skip it and skip straight to prayer. You can't just skip it, skip straight to prayer and do prayer rebelliously. You can't do that. It has to start with meekness. Church, prayer, the Christian life, has to be meek at its very core, obedient, broken wills, in submission to God, obeying government authorities, obeying our leaders, obeying our bosses, wives, obeying our husbands, children, obeying our parents. You can't just be a kid in a home, disobeying your parents, rebelling, doing what you want, saying, you're going to tell me what to do, mom. And you know what? I'm just going to go to God and I'm just going to pray that I get what I want. That is not meek. You think God smiles upon that? No. You think God smiles upon that anymore with a society of people acting that way? He does not. He does not. We need to see the majesty of meekness. I want to show you the majesty. What does meekness yield in my life? What does it yield? It yields blessedness. It yields blessedness. It may seem counterintuitive to you that this would, that this would be blessed, but this is the first fruit of dying to self is blessedness. This is how God pours his medicine upon us, is through our meekness. The more I humble myself, the more I am blessed. The more meek I become, the more blessed I become. You should be striving after more meekness. The most blessed church is the most meek. The Lord does not bless rebels. Satan does. This is why we do not measure the the blessing or the will of God based upon prosperity because that is precisely what the devil promises people is that kind of success. What we gain 
is present blessedness. Notice we are given, it says blessed, they are blessed, not will be or shall be or might be. They are blessed. We gain present blessedness from our meekness. This is something you can have right now here today, right now. You don't got to wait on November and for things to go your way then. You don't have to wait on any of that. You don't have to wait to get your way. You need to die to your way. You know, we have blessedness right now in our submission. It's now. And our inheritance is even seen blessed, blessedly in the present tense here in this verse. Not in part, notice. But it's our inheritance. Notice, we didn't purchase it. We didn't earn it. We didn't even really seek it. It's something that has been passed down to us. We get it because we're in the family. We get it because we know the king. It's, it's been given to us as an inheritance. This is blessed. To inherit the earth is then to receive a title or a deed lost by Adam, stolen by Satan, and regained by Christ, and then rightfully passed down to us. This is what you see here in inheriting the earth. Notice, did Jesus not even say? Because this is important to realize, because the Old Covenant, everything centered around Israel and that piece of land. That's how the Old Covenant worked. The New Covenant, it, it encompasses the whole earth, the whole world, every piece of land. Jesus said even that it should then spread to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. It's not confined to Israel, but the whole earth. We can know God's blessing anywhere on the face of the earth. Anywhere. It's as special having church outside here today as it would be on a mountainside in Israel then. Isn't it? We can know the blessing of God at a martyr's stake, at a guillotine, at a table, in a parking lot, in a small group, at work, even by a graveside. Thank God. So let's wrap this up. Are you meek? Can you be more meek? Are you a bucking bronco or are you a humble heart? Are you a major in meekness? Are you a sheep or are you a goat? Meekness is not optional in our faith. It is essential. Let me tell you this in closing. I have never attended or pastored a church that didn't need to be more meek. I've never seen it. It doesn't exist. This may be one of the massive areas of failing in most churches today. We've got so much of American pride and individualism in the church that the church finds it hard to counterbalance sometimes what makes us different than the world how can we be more meek? How can we not only submit to authority, whether it be your parents, your pastor, your government, or are your boss? How can we not only submit to authority, but also do it gladly? How can we come to the end of ourselves? Marriage isn't about getting your way. Church isn't about getting your way. Society isn't about getting your way. None of this is about getting your way. We are invited to make our own way or to disregard the word of God. It's God's way this morning. Or it's the highway. It's God's way or it's no way. It's God's way all the way. This is the only way that matters. We don't want to do something. You want to do something? You want to do something this morning. You feel the need to do something. Good. Do what scripture says. Submit. Obey. Repent. Turn. You want to know something? Know what the Word of God says. You want to know something? You want to be something? Be what it tells you to be. Be meek. Meekness is not natural. It is supernatural. It isn't weak. It's warriorsome. A strong person has a bridled tongue and a temper and controlled thoughts. We are under control of our Master. Come to Christ. Come to him this morning and learn meekness from the master. Learn submission from the Savior. He will teach you. He will teach you all that you need by his spirit. you got to be willing to say, I'm not doing that right. you got to be willing to mourn it. Really mourn it. Broken tears over it. And then get up every day and seek to kill it until it's finally found dead in you. 
the question for meekness for the Christian is how low can you go? How small can you make yourself? How submissive can you be? We live in a time that talks about being a sheep insultingly. The scriptures talk about it blessedly. Lord, make us meek. In meekness, you're going to find mercy. In meekness, you're going to find might. And in meekness, you're going to find blessed majesty and an inheritance that will not fail. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning as such a narcissistic, self-indulged time in history that we're sure that you've seen before because we find it just so readily at the ready inside of us. It must be so intrinsic to our nature. Father, help us to die to these things. Help us to die to ourselves, our comforts, our want, our wills, our self-assertion and self-determination. Lord, help us die to all that is just us, driving us crazy and running us, us into wars and off cliffs and into church splits and family chaos. Lord, help us die to all this and bring us low into the dirt before you so meekly. Father, let us be like you in your passion, in your will, as even you cried out that night, not my will, but thy will. Lord, make us such people. Make us such people that even pray prayers to you. And when we say thy will be done, we really do mean thy will be done. We mean to do away with our own will, to do away with our own passion, away with our own comforts and preferences over everything. And that we just seek yours. And even if we'd find our own will in opposition to yours, we would still bend a buckled, hard, stiff knee to it just because it's yours. And that we would trust you to change our hearts toward it as we show our loyalty with a bent knee. Father, we need this. We need this at our time in our church. We need it. We need it so powerfully. We don't know anybody else that can do it. I don't know any preacher that can preach a sermon strong enough to persuade. But Lord, I know that your spirit is strong enough to do what the mouth of men are not able to do and what the feet and hands of men could never build on their own. I know that you can do it. Father, I plead with you this morning. Even if I'm the only minister pleading it, Father, at least do it here. At least do it for these few. At least do it for those you've put under me. Lord, make them meek. And those that are meek, make them more meek. And those of us that, that, that you've made meek, Lord, make us hungry to see more meekness worked out and lived out in us. And Lord, help us be an example to those who aren't. Help us to have them come alongside us and show them the paths of majestic meekness. Lord, we ask this for your kingdom, for your glory, and for your will, for your word commands it. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.